Our first group of speakers will give a more horizontal view of issues that permeate all employers across the state of New Jersey. Beginning with the impacts of mental health on the workforce and the need for safe childcare, the following speakers will lead us off. Mary Pat Angelini of the New Jersey Association of Mental Health and Addiction Agencies, Paul Kiltaika, who's the CEO of the Summit Area YMCA and board chair of the New Jersey YMCA State Alliance, Greg Kertsturi, who's the COO of the YMCA of the Pines, Bridget O'Brien of Super Kids in Summit, New Jersey, and also chairs the Early Childhood Education Advocates, and Natasha Hemmings, the CEO at the Girl Scouts of the Heart of New Jersey. Mary Pan Angelini, I'm gonna to toss it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Michelle. The coronavirus has become synonymous with public health, yet public health encompasses mental health, addiction, cancer, et cetera. All of these have been totally ignored during COVID-19. It is common knowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic is taking a severe toll on the mental health and well-being of all Americans. What many might have forgotten is that we were already in the midst of an opioid and suicide epidemic before COVID-19 appeared. CDC just released a study showing excess death rate for 25 to 44 year olds is up 26 and a half percent over previous years. New Jersey's behavioral health system of care was inadequate to fully meet the demand for services pre-COVID. And according to a recent study by NYU, the increasing mental health needs are likely to overwhelm the already frayed mental health system, leading to access problems, particularly for those most vulnerable. This all relates back to New Jersey's workforce across all sectors. Individuals and families, including children, are dealing with fear, isolation, grief, and for many, economic loss, which causes anxiety and stress and depression. Many are juggling caregiving for children who can't attend daycare or school, or for family members who are sick, elderly, or frail, while concerned about how they're going to continue to pay their bills and put food on the table. Unfortunately, we do not have enough mental health and substance abuse treatment providers to meet the needs of New Jersey citizens. Investment is needed, as these impacts will last well beyond the time the virus is brought under control. While we are grateful that most behavioral health funding was maintained in the current state budget, with there being some investment of both state and federal funding, the latter is only temporary. New Jersey must provide significant sustained funding to retain a historically underfunded workforce and expand quality services to have any chance of providing the services and supports that New Jerseyans will need to keep our communities and our economy on a path to recovery. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Paul Kiltaikaka. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. That's I'm okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Pat. And good morning, everybody. And I can tell you on behalf of 31 YMCA's across the state of New Jersey, we are really proud of the work that we have done since March and certainly for the years before that and look forward to continue doing it in the future. Since March, we have been on the front lines of really the essential childcare so that our essential workers can continue to raise their families and get to uh, helping those in our state who are sick and ill and taking care of those children. We work very closely with the Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of Family and Services to make sure that our regulations and restrictions work for everybody in the state, especially in the areas of childcare and camp. We are on the front lines for developing aquatic standards and camp standards for the state. Unfortunately, as we started to roll into the summer and out of the summer when our full buildings were able to open, we had onerous restrictions placed on us. Our YMCAs have done incredible mission work and, and dealing with food insecurity and hosting blood drives and, and the like. Unfortunately though, the restrictions on bringing our members back or membership and fitness and group exercise and youth programs have been completely unacceptable. Out of the 50 states, our 25% capacity is the lowest in the country. Our neighbors such as Pennsylvania are 50% capacity. New York is higher, Connecticut is higher. We need to do better as we enter these cold, months ahead, we know that our members are going to be looking for safe spaces to be at. 
we have proven since March that we can do this in a safe and responsible manner. Our utmost priority is taking care of our community. And we do want to keep them safe. We want to keep our staff safe. And we have an incredible record over the last seven months of doing exactly that. But we know that the public needs us more. And we need to expand the, the capacity limit now because 25%, uh, as Michelle said earlier, while it certainly is not financially sustainable, and it is not, we are most likely losing money doing this. The bottom line is, as I'll quote Mary Pat before, the mental health of our community to be able to go out and enjoy the social and emotional and physical aspects of exercise is at stake here. Without further ado, to talk more about how the child care restrictions impact us, I give you my colleague, Greg, from YMCA The Pines. Greg? Thank you, Paul. Good morning. Child care is a need for families due to the hybrid and remote schedule that many schools are employing for learning this fall and school year. We've worked as a summer camp to meet this urgent community need and as a YMCA as a whole to meet this urgent community need by applying for a child care license at our camp facility and we've had to spend about twenty dollars to $25,000 to obtain the license due to the various regulations that were in place prior to COVID, which in, consist of environmental testing, expert fees, and various inspections. This is money that could have been better allocated towards scholarships and financial assistance for families to afford the increased childcare costs due to the hybrid or remote learning schedule that many students are facing. Given the time that obtaining a license has taken, and we're personally speaking about four months into that process, and the money that has been expended, it'll be difficult to offer the same level of financial assistance that we had hoped to provide um, prior to incurring these costs. And frankly, our, our story is similar to that of many camps and many facilities throughout the state where we're typically providing childcare services as a, through a camp or with a camp license, but are then struggling to be able to provide those services now through a child care license, which has to be obtained. The state's done a fantastic job with efforts to support families through tuition assistance and providers through PPE grants, but additional grant support for licensing costs and for financial assistance for families would be a tremendous help, not only to nonprofits obtaining a temporary use license, such as YMCA of the Pines and other YMCA facilities throughout the state, but also to families who need the care. So thank you, and I'll turn this over to Bridget O'Brien of Super Kids and Summit. Hi, I'm super happy to be speaking to the business community today because for way too long, childcare has either been categorized as welfare or education by our state, which is really a window into the soul that our policymakers don't understand the role we play in the economy or how we operate. Without a clear picture, the danger is that policies are being made that ultimately could hurt all of us, the residents, taxpayers, and businesses. The childcare industry is facing a one-two punch. COVID, unfortunately, is only the first punch. Under the best conditions, we operate with very small margins, we are labor intensive, and we have substantial fixed costs. Just like all of you, reduced capacity is killing us. But when you also have mandatory increased staffing requirements like we do, it's effectively impossible to stay in operation. Some studies estimate as many as 70% of centers in the nation could close without intervention. Governor Murphy heard these alarms and he announced a stabilization grant based on capacity, but unfortunately it's really way too small. We estimate that these grants will only delay closings for about two weeks because they equal less than the additional staffing mandate for less than a month. Those that survive this are gonna face a second punch in the form of our administration's push for universal pre-K. This will ultimately uh, constitute an additional 40% loss of our business, shifting it to the public sector which will have substantial infrastructure costs and add to our staggering pension fund deficit. So where does this leave the child care industry? It seems relatively obvious. Only a fraction of us are gonna be able to survive. This will cause widespread child care deserts for parents of children eight weeks to three years old and prices undoubtedly are gonna to have to go up. It will also certainly cause problems for the workforce who need care outside of the 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. public school hours and reduce the labor market across the board. During the pandemic, 39% of our working parents have already either quit or reduced their jobs because of childcare issues, disproportionately affecting women, especially Latina and black women. 
The hardships aren't going to end there, though, because the 4,100 plus child care centers that employ 87,000 people in the state of New Jersey also contribute $4.1 billion to our state economy. It's going to be a huge financial hole for us to have to fill. So how do we solve this problem? In the short term, with policies that allow businesses to operate safely at capacity or with grants to cover the losses caused by the mandates. In the long term, pursue UPK by partnering with existing state licensed and highly regulated childcare centers. The benefits are many, I'm gonna name quickly just a few. Uh, it pre preserves the tax revenue from this large industry to the state. It eliminates the cost of recreating an already existing pre-K infrastructure, which will cost in the billions. Uh, it utilizes our state's limited resources to concentrate on those who need it first uh, and the most through our CCRNRs also already in place. It absolves the need to use board of ed funds and or increase our local taxes. It gives parents the care options they need to, produce, uh, to be productive in the workforce. It gives parents the flexibility to choose what's most convenient for their work-life balance. It provides children with the same state mandated curriculum as the public schools. And most importantly, but completely overlooked, although it's all over the news this morning, it assures our children are in EPA mandated facilities since our public schools, which have an average age of 68 years old, dangerously do not have any environmental protections. So if the goal is to provide UPK, then this infrastructure is already in place and ready to go almost immediately. And if the goal is to get our state into a period of recovery, then the solution also provides the foundation both socially and economically for our state and all of our businesses to get back to work. So I will now turn it over to Natasha Hemming. Thank you, Bridget. I'm really proud to lead one of four Girl Scout councils in New Jersey, serving over 75,000 girls across the state with the help of over 40,000 adult volunteers and approximately 220 Girl Scout staff. Early on, uh, the pandemic stay at home executive orders upended troop meetings and trips and halted all of our Girl Scout cookie booth sale opportunities which as you can imagine, created a huge financial liability for Girl Scout councils. Um, hundreds of thousands of boxes of cookies remained in our inventories resulting in significant loss in revenue for girl programs and to run our council operations. Across the state, we have thousands of acres of camp properties and still half of the councils made the difficult but necessary decision to cancel all of our in-person summer camp programs. It was a multi-million dollar loss for our Girl Scout councils. Girl Scout councils in New Jersey need access. If you remember nothing else, the governor and our policymakers need to know that Girl Scouts need access. Access to financial resources, access to broadband, um, uh, high-speed wireless uh, communication for our communities, and access to girls and their families to grow membership. We need a mass systematic method of getting the word out to families. Our school access bill is likely on life support since the pandemic, and we need other ways to connect with families. The reality is that most troops are formed through the school system, which in a normal year can be time consuming and expensive to tackle school by school and district by district. But none of our councils are eligible for New Jersey small business grants or emergency funding from pandemic relief funds. And we need access to scholarship money so that we can subsidize more girls' membership and cover costs for adult volunteers in this uncertain economy. We've had to temporarily furlough or permanently separate critical staff. And we're also concerned about the bigger expense down the road around unemployment insurance premiums. The long-term sustainability of Girl Scouts in New Jersey is at risk. And I would ask that the governor and policymakers critically think about the nonprofit community in a way that's tied to the business community to help us 